Recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday, the 25th, one o'clock. This is the virtual reception for Monica James and her exhibition, Access at Edmonds College in the Art Gallery. Thanks for joining us today. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, give a land acknowledgement. Uh, we, I, and I stand on currently on Snohomish land, and you can actually find out where you stand on, you know, on native land by going to native-land.ca. It's a great website that you can just really search any street address around the, around the country um, and find out where you uh, are currently residing or what land you're residing on. Thank you again for joining us today. This is an exciting exhibit uh, for Monica James. Uh, just a little background, Monica James is a, a newly recent, a newly tenured faculty member as of last year. And um, with, uh, with our tradition of faculty members, uh, we always open up a gallery for their exhibit as a way of celebrating their tenure process. And so here we are today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Monica um, um, for the, the presentation. Audie, uh, if you wanna ask a question, please drop it in the chat. And Audie will basically uh, feed questions and um, to Monica throughout the entire program. And at the end, we'll have a Q and A where you can openly ask questions um, to directly to Monica about the work and after the presentation. Thank you very much, Monica. Congratulations. The floor thank is you, all man. yours. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Audie. And thank you to everyone for coming to the Zoom room and the virtual opening for the, the show, Axis. I'm so excited to see all of you virtually. And so many of you, uh, friends and, and family, have been here with me along the way. I see some old friends, some new friends, and it's really, really wonderful to see all of you. And we're actually gonna come out of the, um, the PowerPoint because I'm physically in the space and I should also represent our campus properly. So I did come in the building in my mask, but I'm actually the only one in the gallery today. And I'm just gonna come out of the share of the video. There we go. There we go. Because I'm actually in the space. And I don't have my mask on today, but you can come and visit the show in person. Please do make sure you're masked when you enter our campus buildings. So I do have this here with me, but I'm here by myself today. Well, not virtually. I'm, I'm glad that all of you are here. And I want to try to walk you through the show a little bit and to share with you um, some of the work um, as much as I can. And there's also a presentation that I have for us um, to really show you um, the show virtually as much as I can. And um, I'm hoping to um, really kind of um, share with you, you know, what would happen if you were here in the space with us today. So the show is made up of large format it's difficult to tell online, oil paintings. And I'm at a bit of a crossroads in my work as I'm moving a little bit out of narrative abstraction and more into just pure abstraction. And if you do have questions, as we're going through the gallery talk and talking about the work, please feel free to put those into the chat. And I've got a couple of pieces of information that I wanna share with you, but you might also have some questions that I have not thought of yet. All right, and we can go ahead into the PowerPoint. 
And then I've got some notes to share with you. I'll tell you a little bit about where the work came from. All right. And, you know, thank you to everybody um, on the staff and faculty here at Edmonds. Um, it's been a difficult transition for all of us, but everyone here has been so supportive and so wonderful. And usually our gallery is, um, you know, face to face, but as we have gone, you know, virtual, everyone's been really wonderful in helping with that transition. So this is a view of the show as we were uh, creating the installation. Um, but a couple of the images show you also more of the process. So we can go ahead to the next slide. And this is a close up of a piece that's in the show called Modified Carbon. And it's oil on canvas, um, fairly large, but the process that I use to create these paintings comes from the Italian Renaissance. And I um, start with a black and white and grayscale. And then the color goes on in translucent layers. So we could take a look at the next slide because I brought some of my process images to show you how these start. And this is, um, I don't know, probably a, a quarter of the way in. The, the black and white and grayscale does take quite a bit of time. These are painted in oil and I absolutely love um, the um, color and um, ability to uh, reflect and convey light that oil paint can do. Uh, it's, a, it's a very translucent medium, but also can be very opaque and very textural. So it's got all the things that I love and I'm very patient too. So I don't mind waiting for it to dry. You do have to wait for that to dry. And some people may not like oil for that reason. Um, but they start out all as, as grayscale. And so this was, I don't know, maybe layer five, just as I started, just starting adding the color. And so the color goes on in layers and layers and layers. And because of the way light works, light will travel through layers of oil paint and bounce back to our eyes. And, and it um, really uh, glows and kind of resonates light. So we can take a look at the, at the next image. And this is Broken Circle, which is mixed media on wood. And besides oil, I love working with all kinds of materials. Um, some of you that might be here as my student, you may have me as a pottery student or drawing, uh, but I also love painting and I love working with mixed media, with different materials, uh, wood, is one of my favorites. I've been working with wood um, all the way back to my undergraduate um, when I learned how to make woodcuts as a printmaker. And I would almost fall in love with my plates, the actual wooden plates that I would carve, sometimes more than the image itself. After I printed it, you know, I, I loved the, the plate would be covered with ink and colorful um, and kind of show the history of that process. And I really enjoyed carving wood and printmaking. And um, many years later, um, after my father passed away, I inherited his wood carving tools. And he used to carve canes and sculptures. And he also liked to draw and things too. But there was something very, and still today, I still use my dad's tools a lot. There's something very special about creating with the, the tools that um, he used to create. Um, and we can go ahead to the, to the next slide. Um, thank you so much, Min. This also happened in layers. And I really like wood because I like to carve into it. Sometimes I'll sand it. And in person, um, you can see a lot of depth um, in the piece. And um, they're layered. So, you know, this kind of shows you some of the layers that are underneath of that piece. And, you know, I painted it and then sanded it and then, you know, painted on top of that. And, and it's kind of a, a back and forth process. 
where I'll add things, and then maybe I'll cover things or I'll wipe things away. Um, so the, the painting almost gets built in the way a sculpture might go together. Thanks, we can take a look at the, at the next image. This is Morning Star. And the process image is on the right, just as I was starting to add the blue. And so this, you know, kind of gives you an idea of where it started and, and where it went to many, many layers later. There's probably 70 to 100 layers of paint um, on the surface. And we can take a look at the next image. And we'll go back one. And here's Revolution. This almost became the, the title of the show, but um, with current events, um, I didn't want to um, um, connect with other things that are negative. And um, so I went with Axis instead because it really kind of represents the, the turning point where I am with my work. And this piece is heavily, heavily layered. It actually lived in my studio for three years. And then we can take a look at the next slide because it was like this. And I didn't even have the circles on it. It was blue. And I like to play with water and texture and you know, just letting paint run, um, splattering paint. I've, been known to take my son's water guns and spray my paintings sometimes and see what the water will do. And I got stuck. I really loved this one so much and I had no idea what I wanted to do with it. And so it was, you know, like in the corner of abandoned art in my studio. And, um, and then we can kind of go backwards one to see where it went to it had a revolution <laughs> and it finally um, figured things out and um, the circle is a really powerful symbol for me um, i was always drawn to the shape both symbolically um, metaphorically as a young student i fell in love with the work of wassily kandinsky and he was really one of the first artists at the turn of the last century of 100 years ago to go completely abstract and to kind of leave the real world behind. So as I was going through that process, I thought this is a great time to um, get back to the circles. And, and I've always loved the, the metaphor of um, the circle itself. Uh, there are many artists who talk about um, universal uh, metaphors and that many colors or shapes have a universal meaning that they convey or communicate. You know, a, a triangle will um, um, convey power. Everything comes to a point at the top. That's why we have it on our dollar bill. The, the power and strength of the pyramid, you know, which thousands of years later shows us the power and strength of the Egyptian civilization. Um, but circles have a different meaning. I think about the circles of Stonehenge or um, the circles of time, the circles um, that we see in astronomy, our cycles that we move through on a planetary level and even on a personal level, you know, our cycles of life and the cycles of, of um, spring and, and summer and fall, the seasons. So everything comes in cycles. <laughs> and it's also a compositional challenge. So I decided I would challenge myself and I said, okay, you know, I'm gonna work just with circles and see what I come up with. So we can take a look at the next one. And that's where it started. And well, I guess to go to really go back, you know, who am I? Where, where did I start? Where did I come from? 
Um, you know, I grew up in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, my accent may, may come in and out. And I went to school at Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. And these are some of the, the pictures of all the way back in the 90s um, when I decided, okay, I'm going to be an artist and went off to school. And we had a phenomenal time at Tyler School of Art. It was a really talented group of students, but we were also very supportive of each other. And um, we got together and um, formed like a student union. So the picture on the bottom is of us at one of our shows. We put together, I think two or three shows when we were students. Um, and the picture on the top is of me giving the, the speech at graduation. Um, but uh, the, the support that we had for each other as artists has really continued today. And, and we can go on to the next. And um, it was at that time that I discovered printmaking. And I was really interested in art history and my own history. Um, what was the, the, the history of my ancestors, the art that they created, the history of African art, the history of Native American art. And I was really, really fascinated with hieroglyphics, with um, text, um, with the written word and calligraphy itself, the art of, of the written word. Um, and um, tradition and today. And, and I was kind of mixing up all of these different influences. And the, the pictures here are from my trip to Ghana. Uh, I think it was in my, my junior year, I got the chance to travel to West Africa. And we went to Ghana and spent a semester and I almost didn't come back. I fell in love, the food was fantastic. Um, I had never um, lived in a more um, rural area and it was very, very different. Um, and the, the images at the top of our, are from our trip. Uh, we visited an artist who created Adinkra fabrics. And we also took a tour. Uh, we saw Kente, we visited um, a, an entire village dedicated to the creation and weaving of Kente fabric. But into the fabric are symbols. And uh, Dinkra symbols um, come from the Ashanti peoples of Ghana. And the symbols have meaning. And, and for me as an artist, this idea you know, of using kind of sim symbol that communicated meaning is really fascinating. And, and then at the bottom right, I'm starting to kind of weave these things into my work as a drawing. But then I got into printmaking and we can take a look at the next slide. And um, I majored in printmaking. I just really fell in love with it. Um, this is actually a, a piece of my mom and I. She came, um, it's so great to see her here virtually today. Uh, she was here, this was at my first show. And the, the piece that's behind us is titled Shepsu. And its inspiration comes from ancient Egypt. There's even sand in the piece. But in the background, um, what kind of looks like texture or different colors are actually silk screen. It's screen printed. Um, so I had um, some hieroglyphics and um, some other um, images. I, I think Tutmosis is in there. I think I see the face of Tutmosis. Um, this was made probably 20 years ago. But this was to kind of show you where a lot of these thoughts and ideas come from. You know, it's, it's abstraction, but there's a lot of um, narrative mixed in and, and underneath. Um, so the shapes and images and colors really come from um, things that I am uh, learning about, discovering, and, and that kind of funnels into my work. So we can take a look at the next slide. And I guess being from Pittsburgh, you know, Andy Warhol came from Pittsburgh. I just probably couldn't help, um, you know, loving uh, 
silk screen and printmaking. Um, years and years later, I went on and finished my master's degree at Savannah College of Art and Design. And I majored in painting and I really continued to experiment with printmaking. So this has a mono print in the background and the, the blue lines that you see are lino cut. And then on top of that is an auto gravure, which is kind of an etching, but it's a photographic technique for an etching. And there's kind of a graffiti abstract um, text for Egypt. At this time, I'm still very, very interested in the history of ancient Egypt and the artwork that's created um, and kind of weaving that into my work. So we can take a look at the next slide, kind of moving through time. Um, and at that time, I actually took a big jump back in time. Um, my Aunt Lindy um, gave me, she had discovered some old, old family photos. And the man in the photo, Shug Evans, is my four times great grandfather. And he was born into life as an enslaved person in Virginia. And the writing that's behind him is from his slave pass. So um, in Virginia, there were very, very serious and, and um, uh, laws for runaways. And you had to have identification or you could be taken and sold. So somehow he had kept this and pass this down to his children and grandchildren. And here I was holding this today. And it really connected for me how close that was. You know, history, you know, wow, this was just four generations away. Um, and so all of the, you know, it just opened up that this was kind of like a big spark of inspiration for me, you know? And also it was pretty rare to have photographs from that time period. So this was actually a tin type. So, um, you know, being able to look at his face, you know, and through, through a, a photograph, you know, we had kind of this connection, you know, with my ancestors and I had to make a piece. And so I immediately started drawing and it started out as collage. And, and then I went right to printmaking because I knew I could layer the image and experiment with the image. And so, you know, all the things that I was thinking and feeling went into the colors that I was choosing, you know, how I was playing with color and shape. And I created this whole series and I think I only have three of them left because I gave the rest of them away to my family. So uh, most of my living family have a, a copy of Shug Evans. And uh, we can take a look at the next image because I was living in Savannah, Georgia at the time and it's a city full of history. Um, Philadelphia, where I uh, got my undergraduate, is also full of history. You know, I don't know if I was attracted to live in those places because maybe I have an affinity for that, mm, probably. Um, but I just loved it. I mean, you can walk down the streets of Savannah and if, if you imagine there's no cars or maybe there's no cars that day, you could really imagine that you're, you know, walking down the street 200 years ago. And you're still on cobblestones and everything. So there was a lot of living history all around me. And um, there were lots of sites that I was going to tour. Um, that was um, a huge, huge uh, port in the slave trade. And um, there are three major ports in the United States. The other is in... Um, Charleston, South Carolina, and the other in Richmond, Virginia. And eventually I traveled to all of those cities and did some research and I became really interested in the newspaper. And I think I was always kind of interested in the news, the newspaper and, and text and, uh, but, but also culture and, you know, what, what was in there. And 
it started out in Savannah and I started looking at the microfilm and I went to the historic society and the, the, the image of my ancestor had also really enraptured me and I wanted to see, could I find other pictures? Um, Savannah has uh, a, a museum called the, um, um, the Owens Thomas House and they have the oldest preserved slave cabins in the United States. It still has the original paint on the walls, um, which was actually a beautiful shade of periwinkle. It was called haint blue. Um, but a lot of history just, just within that space itself. And so I went over to the Historic Society. I said, well, let me see what else I can find. Whoa, I found a lot. <laughs> I mean, it was in the paper all the time. So I was just gathering tons and tons of images stories, but the stories came together in interesting ways. Um, for example, I came across an ad for a runaway slave named Fortune. And in my mind, I thought, well, that's really strange, first of all, to name an enslaved person Fortune. And then it was a runaway ad. And as I continued to look through the microfilm, they continued to post looking for fortune. And like a year later, they were still posting an ad looking for a runaway named Fortune. And I thought, all right, fortune got away. And there was the title for the painting. <laughs> and so in that way, you know, just kind of gleaning or reading between the lines of the newspaper ads, um, these pieces started to come together. Yamacraw is a neighborhood in Savannah, Georgia. It still exists today. And um, during uh, the times of slavery, this was also um, a area of town where both enslaved people and free people lived. Um, post um, emancipation, um, speed forward to the civil rights movement, Savannah, Georgia, was actually desegregated a year earlier than the rest of Georgia. So there's also a really interesting history in Savannah. Um, it's also um, right next door to the Gullah Geechee Islands where a lot of African Yoruba culture is preserved. And you can look at sculptures and carvings and um, textiles baskets from the Gullah Geechee areas in Savannah and, uh, the, and the Carolinas that look exactly like art from the west coast of Africa. So a lot of really interesting connections. Um, we can zip forward to the next piece. And at the time I was working on this series, I thought, I'm just going to go completely abstract and I'm going to, you know, I'm still interested in the narrative, but I was listening to the news and, you know, there's lots of tough things on the news. And, and I guess that that's also kind of in the work too, because it's like a very dark time and very light. There's still, you know, hope and a lot of beautiful things that are, are happening at these times. So um, there's a lot of that duality, I think, in the work, but uh, one story in particular that just kept pulling at my heart was the forest fires and, and watching um, the sequoia. I have really, really long, long wanted to go and visit. And over the, the past couple years, it seems like every time I want to go, there's a forest fire. So I've been, you know, kind of holding off. So I have really bad luck. I would probably, you know, have a bad event if I tried to visit. Um, and please do feel free to interrupt with any questions. But, but I, I'm zipping along here, but did anybody, did I miss any questions going? Just a lot of really nice feedback um, about how beautiful your work is, how it's really powerful, honoring your ancestors. It's incredible. Lots and lots of really nice compliments. Um, no questions quite yet, but I'll let you know. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm so glad that's coming through virtually. <laughs> 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 
the, this piece is layered, but I use resin. I use two part epoxy resin and they started out with all, I started out experimenting with all kinds of things. I was using plexiglass, glass, um, you know, acrylic, um, wax. I tried encaustic painting, um, but some of you who are here from Tyler School of Art, I saw some of my wonderful alumni are here. Beautiful to see you. You remember the year we almost set the studio on fire. And one of our students, um, had an accident with encaustic painting. So none of us got to learn encaustic painting that year. <laughs> I will get to it though. One day, I, I still need to get to know the wax, but I really love glass. And as a little girl, we used to go visit Corning Glass and watch them blow glass. They had like a museum. We'd go up to um, Niagara Falls and Corning is along the way. And besides just plates and cups, they also teach glass. I mean, you can see historic Venetian glass. You can, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. So that, you know, I think sparked the young artist in me very young. And um, so I wanted that look of glass or even like water, the way you would, or ice, the way you would look through and see something at the depths. Um, but really have this kind of slick and, and glass-like texture. You know, the, the materials that you use kind of have their own language. Um, and so, you know, th this, these pieces started out, you know, and I said, okay, I can't deny my heartstrings and my, um, my soul's pulling me back and I really want to explore this narrative. So, I actually had two pieces of wood all the way from Virginia. And years and years ago, I, we set some pieces on fire and I loved it, but then I got stuck. <laughs> I said, this is great. This is a great idea. And so we went, we set some pieces on fire. I think my friend Freddie was helping me because he gave me some recycled wood and I said, I don't want to go buy new wood anymore. I want to start using recycled materials. And then it looked so cool. I didn't know what to do next. I was like, oh, darn it. Now what do I do? And, and so they just kind of lived with me for a while. So I don't know. I guess this was like my version of, of uh, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Mona, da Vinci carried Mona Lisa around for 10 years. <laughs> and I, I don't think he ever gave it back to the patron who bought it. <laughs> but... You know, they just, they lived with me and they sat with me. And then when I was watching these forest fires, I knew exactly what to do. And I pulled those pieces out and I had two of them because I was thinking about like opposites, day and night, yin and yang. And I thought, well, I'll do a diptych, you know, two parts of the story, or this may just be the start of a story. I may, you know, continue in here. Um, but the, the image that you see in the, in the background um, I started doing some research in the areas surrounding the um, Sequoia National Park. And um, here at, at Edmonds, I've been working a lot with the powwow committee and also um, got to go visit part of the uh, canoe journey two years ago. And the, uh, the living history and um, culture of Native American um, culture is amazing here on the West Coast. And so there's so many places uh, to go and learn. And when I started looking at California, I thought, well, what happened to the indigenous people around the Sequoia National Forest? Where are the water protectors and the protectors of the land who were there traditionally? You know, what has happened to the indigenous people of the Sequoia Forest, who, who would have been, um, you know, conducting prescribed burns or kind of managing the forest in, in their own way. And when I started my research, ooh, man, I didn't know what I was getting into. It's very, very dark history. Um, this might be triggering for anybody. If it, if it is, please hang out with us after. I know this is a tough time 
you know, and even just today is, is we're kind of watching, you know, war unfold before our eyes. So um, my, you know, I don't want to open up any wounds for anybody, but, you know, my real goal is to just share um, and hopefully try to um, close some of those wounds. So the image that you see is actually from um, the Phipps Proclamation of 1775. And, and what I discovered was a horrifying genocide um, and really state sanctioned that wiped out more than 250 people, 250,000 uh, people and over 70 tribal nations. Um, between the years of, I think, 1860, you know, 1848, the population of California of indigenous people was about 150,000. Those, those were not you know, exact census. But within the next 60 years, it was reduced by nearly 90% um, to just 16,000 people in 1910. So the, the brink of extinction. And if you look really closely, and as we come out and kind of ask questions, I may try to get us in so we can kind of zoom in, you can see the layers underneath. And there's tiny, tiny little um, people shooting. Um, and the, the proclamation itself so is called death by proclamation. And we can take a look at the next piece. The next piece, you really kind of see the trees and see the fires. And there's some text, and in the, the text um, from this piece is from another proclamation that um, was printed. I got lost in my notes. But it, it was another proclamation that is calling... Um, for scalps. And, you know, as, as when I was a student going to public school, I always thought that scalping was created by people here in the Americas, indigenous people in the Americas. And I had no idea that this was brought um, from um, colonizers. And to give you an idea of the um, monetary value, because you can see the $200, and I really wanted you to be able to see and read this text. Sometimes I bury things like a little gem, so you have to kind of hunt and find it, or you might maybe see it later, like, ooh, it's a little surprise. Um, but at that time, um, this particular proclamation, um, men who were alive were 50 pounds and 40 pounds of just the scalp. Women's scalps were 25 and you could get 20 pounds for the scalps of children. The average annual salary of a teacher, and this kind of hit me because I'm a teacher, uh, during this time period was 60 to 120 pounds. So for you know, murdering someone, you could turn that in to the state and get paid a bounty that was about the same as a teacher would earn in an entire year. Um, just recently in the news, the governor of California has come out and um, shared an official apology from the state and, you know, I think is starting those kind of processes, uh, maybe of, of reparations or, or at least an acknowledgement and saying, hey, this, this, this is what happened, you know. Um, the current administration is not responsible for it, but we acknowledge that this happened you know, and, and this was the involvement of the state. And this is what we're going to try to do to heal from this. Um, oh, so this one was from the Daily Republican newspaper in Winona, Minnesota, from September 24th of 1863. So, yeah, the narrative that's in there is, is, is fairly um, difficult. And in a way, it's almost like my catharsis. So like, as I'm working through this, I don't know, this is like my art therapy, I guess. <laughs> we, we can kind of cut that and I'll see if I can get us a closer view. And I think I, I saw a question. Yeah, 
question? Sorry to interrupt. Could we return to the previous image? Um, there were a few questions that came up. Um, I'm not sure if the image is better or if the, yeah, we might be able to get in closer with those images because they have a glare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that might be better. And in the color, thank you for asking about the color. I really wanted something that was totally 80s. And I hate to say it that way, but I just can't think of any other way to say it. And so I guess I'm maybe showing my age or, you know, diff to me, different time periods have a different color. So if I was going to look at the 70s, you know, I'd probably have some rust orange and beige and <laughs> there would be certain colors we would pick for that time period uh, or, or, or the 50s. And th this one actually might go into the 50s too with that robin's egg blue. Um, but I was thinking about like the, the laser, I don't know, like the, the, the rays. So like these bullets coming out like rays and um, I, I get kind of brought out that, that era. And turquoise is a sacred color and a sacred stone for indigenous people. So the turquoise also became a symbolic color within this piece. Um, in, in the other piece, um, the um, California Bounty, the reds just came from fire. I was really just thinking about the fire and the smoke. And there's, there's some, you know, the wood is burnt underneath. There's some uh, pieces of, um, of pine that are in there. And then in person, you can see the layers a little bit better. And the figures are really running on top. And I should check and see if anybody have any questions. So we can also try to see in the gallery. I'm just not sure how good the, the Zoom um, picks up on those close up. A question came up uh, in response to the effect that you were trying to create that glass or ice like effect. Um, somebody asked if you tried glass blowing at Tyler. <laughs> I wish, I wish. I did a lot of ceramics at Tyler and sculpture. Really enjoyed sculpture. Um, just recently, I got to try glass blowing. And that's at a place here called the Pratt Art Center. If you are local to this area, I would highly encourage you to take a class at the Pratt. Um, my teacher uh, worked with Dale Chihuly, uh, Janie. She was absolutely incredible. And um, their, their facilities are wonderful. But you know, I sadly, it was not my thing. I, I enjoyed it, but it just, it wasn't quite, um, I didn't take to it, you know, it wasn't my home base, you know. I'm going to continue and I really want to try um, more working with like painting and glass and you can kind of work with like powdered glass or etching or other things and um, I want to try to do that. And I hope that works. Does that give you a little bit of a better view of What's happening close up? Yeah, I'm not sure how good the camera is to help see some of the details. But it does have a bit of a glare to it as well. <laughs> yeah, this was one of the other pieces that we chatted about. I'm yeah, sure with, with acrylic, I was like painting and layering um, with acrylic to see too, like what would happen if I put space between the pieces. And as you move, they kind of shift around. Monica, how did you determine the layout for this exhibit? Is there any significance to the arrangement, the way that they're hung? 
Well, I definitely wanted to separate kind of these two ideas. So there's kind of the abstract works and then we group the narrative works together. So they're kind of telling a similar story. Excuse me, Monica, could we get a um, overall room shot from a couple, couple of different angles or corners so we can kind of see both the, the narrative and the abstract kind of <clears throat> play with each other a little bit or how they, thank you. You bet, you bet. So we almost tried to give them their own space. <laughs> Abstract world. <laughs> and then a little bit of the narrative world. And they're little in comparison. The, the size is very different, so. Color's tough because I was really thinking of different colors, different color palettes as I was creating. So I never really, I mean, I think about it, but I don't try to. Design it as a show. So I tend to think about each piece um, more as an individual. Hey, Monica, it's Maisie. I just want to say thank you. You've really touched in so much power and I'm really affected by a lot of this and it's really opened up my heart and inspiration. It's very, 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 very powerful. And I think that even though the narrative is small, it's definitely so, so powerful and so much details you have in there. That one, like, so I guess my question is with this, that piece right in front of me, I love yeah. that piece, but a lot of your abstract work, how do you determine which way it goes? Because I can see it going so many different ways as in like flipping it over completely backwards. How did you determine, like not that one, because that has a lot of work in the middle, but some of the other abstract pieces, it can almost go so many different ways. And yeah. how do you determine which way, like, did you know at the beginning that that was the way you wanted to go? Or when you moved it to dry it, did you ever get like, I don't know, worked on it different um, three, six, I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say? That is an excellent question. Thank you. And I'm so glad to hear that feedback because I really wanted to bring people some joy with this show. This one and the one I just showed you and you know, I guess maybe this is also why I called this one revolution because boy, you could turn this piece and turn this piece and put it on a record player and turn it right round, right round. And at the beginning, it had a direction. <laughs> but then as I'm working, so sometimes I'll add the next layer and it says, I want to go this way. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. So I tend to like leave it in my studio and then I'll rotate it. Sometimes I'll have to come back the next day. This one took me like a week just to figure out. And even like, as I thought I had it figured out and I'd leave it sitting on the easel and then I come down the net and I go, wait, darn it. <laughs> Another wonderful helper is I have this wonderful critique group. And um, there's a couple of friends that I went to Tyler with and, and we still chat and, and critique each other's work. So we'll video call each other or email each other um, and ask for feedback and um, kind of have a working critique. And it, sometimes I'll have something in my head and heart and, or, or I'll, you know, think that it's conveying a certain thing and then we chat about it and I see it's going somewhere different. <laughs> and it really helps me to kind of see what the viewer sees because we each have our own um, different uh, perspective. And um, in, in this way, sometimes abstraction is a little harder 
because it's not set in stone and it's not concrete and it's, you know, um, so it's more by feel and by intuition and, and, and your, your gut, you know, um, and sometimes that voice is really loud, you know, almost like Jiminy Cricket, you know, don't do that or do this or paint it red or paint it blue or turn it this way. And sometimes it's not so hard or they're not so loud and you have to listen or, or sit with it for a little while. And um, it's always kind of a conversation between me and the piece. <laughs> Someone asked a related question. Um, Monica, you live in both an abstract and figurative world. Which has the stronger gravitational pull? That is a great question. That's a great question. I, I think with this show, I tried to force gravity. <laughs> and I tried to say, okay, we're going abstract here. But I couldn't let go of the narrative. And, and I guess for me, um, I've, I've really always really created kind of my best work um, when I'm mixing everything together. Uh, it, you know, it's almost like gumbo from Louisiana, you know, it, it, and the more you add to it, the more flavorful and, and soulful um, it becomes. So, you know, I guess more and more, you know, I have learned to maybe to em embrace all of those things and, and to just um, more, I'm, I'm more so um, maybe like a DJ mixing it together. <laughs> and, and when you have all those different pieces, at least for me, um, it's also more fun too. It, it, I enjoy that process. Uh, I love learning about new things, different cultures, different people, different history. And it just kind of enriches that process for me. So I'm probably gonna continue doing both <laughs> and, and just see what evolves and, and, and uh, see where it goes. Um, I'm really, really interested in exploring glass and also recycled materials more. Um, and, and trying to weave those together more in plastic. <laughs> Is that glass and plastic in a sculptural form or within your two-dimensional work? I think I'd like to try it as a two-dimensional um, almost like, like these paintings, but um, in glass. Another question. Um, do you think the past two years has changed your art or how you view your art? It has, it has. And, and I've discovered more and more that I, I really tend to think about environment and the space and, and where I am and um, how that affects my work. And, you know, so much of your experiences, your life experiences, they definitely affect the art that you create. But there's also a core of me that does not change. Um, I think one of my first abstract pieces had circles in it. <laughs> this obsession with circles goes way back. And for those of my students in pottery, I also teach throwing on the wheel. Also really enjoy um, functional pottery and throwing. And it's very Zen and you know, very circular and centered practice. Um, so I don't think I'll ever lose my obsession with circles. <laughs> That's an awesome question. Hi, Monica. It's Min. I just want to be, honor everybody's time. It's almost 2 o'clock, folks. If anybody has any last second questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, for those of you who might need to drop off to go to another meeting, please, please feel free to do so at any time. And thank you for joining us again. And thank you again, Monica, for all your work. 
in this uh, exhibit and uh, congratulations again on your tenure and uh, getting through this exhibition process remotely. But I think, you know, it's a testament that we all have gone through in various ways to try to continue on with our work and process uh, despite being remote. Um, there's lots of thank yous coming to you right now. And uh, again, this will be recorded uh, for those of you who are want to watch it again and for looking for extra credit uh, who might want to watch it again, just uh, get some more information then for your papers. And, uh, and then I'll, of course, forward this to uh, Monica for all the, the chat information so that way she can see it. So this is our, vis our virtual guest book. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, oh, and we're open through the March 18th. So face to face and you can check on the website. And thank you all so much. Yes. Hope this made everybody's day. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank all of you. And if there are any lingering questions, if you know, I didn't want to honor people's time, but if there are any lingering questions, um, or you know, I did say, you know, as we talked about some things that were might be kind of upsetting if you just needed to touch base or connect with a good resource. Please.